I would like to start my presentation uh, uh, with a quote of this famous and my favorite artist, Van Gogh. So this is what Van Gogh said uh, about normality. I quote, normality is a paved road. It's comfortable to walk, but no flowers grow. So with that note, I would like to introduce my new topic, Health Humanities. As it says, it's just a very brief introduction about this presentation. So um, before I do so, uh, I have a very ambitious plan for you, and I hope to complete within an hour or so and then take questions. I plan to cover the following uh, themes. And I see that there is a groundswell of interest in health humanities. I'm glad to see that. So my lecture would be very introductory in nature and plans to cover uh, the following themes. First, I would like to introduce you to a very short history of health humanities. I'll be choosing a wave approach, which I would explain as we go along the presentation, where I will introduce you to uh, medical humanities, health humanities, and critical and planetary health humanities. The second thing that I want to do in my presentation is to introduce you to some of the major areas of inquiry in health humanities. I'll also talk a bit about some of the key terms which operate this field called health humanities, foundational texts, uh, which are the basic um, reading material on health humanities, and some of the major journals, perhaps, that you need to consult in case you choose to research on health humanities. And finally, a very short um, note on illness narratives. Uh, here, I'll be answering a couple of questions. One, who are the narrators of uh, health humanities, and what shape does that particular narrative, you know, take form? Uh, um, even before I do so, I would like to preface my uh, conversation by briefly letting you know some of the recent trends which I have called as big ideas in humanities. So my first observation is that there is a dramatic change in the way humanities is practiced in the 21st century. Specifically, from a literary point of view, we have sort of moved away from an author-centric or a theme-centric approach to more multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and you know what I call the transversal approach to humanities. For instance, I hardly see if you are from well-established research institutions in the country or across the globe, you hardly hear things like you know, feminist reading of Tony Morrison or postmodern elements in you know, Thomas Pynchon work and so on. They're slightly outdated and not so relevant perhaps in 21st century because you see that literature is more comfortable and also engages with other discourses such as science, technology, social sciences, medicine, among others. So what I'm going to do in the next couple of slides is just to introduce you to some of the interdisciplinary you know, field of thought. If you are an early career researcher or just thinking about a PhD problem, I invite you to consider some of them that I'm listing right away. <clears throat> I have two such slides. So one of the things that you would observe here, as I said, they are interdisciplinary and then it engages multiple fields. Or literature is crossing, crisscrossing. Um, there is an interesting expression which I want to use here. It's multiple horizontal crossings. I'm just going to give you a list of them. And some of you might already know it. Some of you may be, you know, you are knowing it for the first time, whichever may be the case. I thought this would be a very useful list to make note of. So I'm just reading out uh, in interest of time. Uh, I'm just reading out. Perhaps I can take some of these questions in Q&A. Digital humanities, health humanities, environmental humanities and climate studies, animal studies. Plant humanities is a very emerging area. In fact, I would say that it started in 2019. There is a Harvard group, which you know I'll explain uh, maybe the late part of the presentation. But then I want you to make note that this very new emerging field called plant humanities. Anthropocene, post-humanism uh, studies, planetary humanities, 
visual studies, specifically a lot of interest in comics, television, and film. Of course, you have film studies, which is already established in many um, uh, departments and institutions. But then uh, there is an interest in um, comics and television, immigration and refugee studies, post-racial studies. If you're from linguistics or language background, a lot of interest in biolinguistics, genetics and language, celebrity studies, law and literature. It's another upcoming um, emerging area, at least in this country. And I just want you to also look at a possible convergence, which is happening in recent time, where you have health humanities plus environmental humanities plus post-humanism plus planetary humanities. That's called as planetary health humanities, as recent as 2020, which I would explain in the course of my presentation as well. This is slide two. Again, I'm continuing with some of the recent trends in humanities. Natural language processing and artificial intelligence, cognitive linguistics, memory studies is a very emerging and novel area in India, especially IIT Chennai has a center for memory studies. So if you are interested, I invite you to look at their website, disability studies, trauma studies, post-colonial, not post-colonial studies, but then there's a lot of interest in native post-colonialism, men and masculinity studies, globalization studies, eight studies, which is also called gerontology, death, dying, and bereavement studies, which is like involving using anthropology and cultural anthropology and so on, human rights and literature, sports literature, and finally, energy humanity. So one of the things that is happening um, uh, in the 21st century humanities, as I said, is crisscrossing and literature is more comfortable with uh, all kinds of fields. And I also invite you to think of literature not necessarily in terms of verbal literature, which is to say poetry, poem, and novels. But then I invite you to have an expansive understanding of literature itself as the way how a cultural study scientist would you know, define it, which would include all sort of cultural practices from dance to sculpture to poem to, you know, um, uh, uh, visual um, uh, literature and so on. So let me uh, specifically go into my field of expertise, you know, which is um, health humanities. So as I said, the next three, four slides would introduce you to a very brief, short history of health humanities. Specifically, the first wave of health humanities was called as medical humanities. Let me explain uh, what medical humanities is, uh, when did it start, and how is it different from the phrase that we commonly use these days, health humanities. So it all started in uh, 1948, and two writers, George Sarton, and Francis Segel, they coined the descriptor medical humanities. And interestingly, the term appeared in an obituary column in a journal called ICs. I quote here, his death, referring to Edmund Andrews, at the early age of 48, is a sad blow to the medical humanities for very much could have been expected from him. As I said, this is for the first time we encounter the word medical humanities. And the word, the term X, you know, appears in a journal called ICs. And ICs, as you can see that note, is a journal devoted to the study of science, medicine, and civilization. The term appears in 1948. And interestingly, it took maybe a decade or so before North American medical school underwent a major curriculum development in bringing humanities into medical education. But then you have to also keep in mind that medical humanities did exist in some form or other even before 1948, which, you know, if you are interested, we will take up that particular issue of the origins of medical humanities during Q&A. Now, in 1967, this is very interesting, the first Department of Humanities 
was established in a medical school. And this happens in Pennsylvania State University's College of Medicine. Here, what you see is medical students studied religion, history, and philosophy, as these were seen as more applicable for medicine. But then you also see literature was introduced into medical curriculum in 1969. So what you see here is the early history of medical humanities in the US, but then um, it slowly gained currency in Britain only in 1990s. The third landmark um, you know, year in the history of um, um, uh, health humanities is 1972. What is interesting here is, uh, here is uh, Banks, Joanne Trotman Banks, uh, who passed away in 2007. But then she is a professor of literature but then she held a regular full-time faculty position in an American medical school. So this is very interesting because here is a professor of literature, but then she was teaching, um, uh, having a regular position in an American medical school. But then beyond this, one of the most important thing that I want you to note is uh, she is the founders of one of the most important journals in health humanities, uh, literature and medicine. The literature and medicine is the foremost and the most important journal in health humanities. And she was the founder of uh, literature and medicine. The literature and medicine is still in vogue and uh, it was published in 1980s and 81. So in case you are interested in medical humanities as a research career, I invite you to look at this particular journal and read the first issue of the journal Literature and Medicine, which is published by the Johns Hopkins University Press. So um, in 1978, Trotman, in her article titled The Wonders of Literature in Medical Education, I'm quoting here, I just I'm reading that very important part of uh, the section in her article. I quote, using literary methods and texts Literary scholars have been teaching medical students and physicians how to listen more fully to patients' narratives of illness and how to better comprehend illness and treatment from patients' point of view. These skills help physicians to interview patients, to establish therapeutic alliances with patients and their families, to arrive at accurate diagnosis, and to choose and work toward appropriate clinical goals. In some way, what Trotman does here is to set and sum up the dominant agenda of the first wave of health humanities, which is called the medical humanities. And what does this say? This says medical humanities was interested in two things. One, it was interested in creating a gentleman, sensitive and empathic, you know, empathetic physician. But then you cultivate these qualities through introducing literature to them. So the first major aim of medical humanities was to create a gentleman physician, a physician who is good in observation, a physician who is good in communication, a physician who is trained in listening to the patient's point of view and had high doses of empathy and self-reflection. So the first aim or the major aim of medical humanities is to cultivate a gentleman physician and to do so literature, history, philosophy and fine arts among other liberal arts were introduced um, to the physicians to develop these faculty. So what you see here, interestingly, is humanities was just an add on, a value addition course to the clinical science. They used humanities to improve the faculties of, you know, of the physician and transform him to an empathetic, sensitive 
and a gentleman physician. So to put in one or two words, medical humanities, which is the first phase or the first wave of health humanities was more a pragmatic discourse, which was heavily centered on doctor and patient relationship. And in this framework, doctor or physician was seen as more important and rest of them were seen as secondary actors. So I'm going to sum up the first um, wave for you. So as I said, A, it was physician centric. Two or B, it was just interested in revising the medical curriculum. Why? So that more liberal arts could be introduced to medical curriculum. And why was more, you know, um, artwork or liberal arts introduced into medical curriculum so that you turn the physicians to gentlemen physician. In other words, if you were to look at the status of arts or liberal, you know, studies within the medical humanities phase, it was just a value addition. As I said, an add on course or arts was in service to the medical education and practice. Now, moving to the second phase, which is called the health humanities phase, I'm going to explain you how health humanities phase is different from medical humanities now. So there are three parts that I want to keep uh, in mind. The first is inclusive. The second is the broad and the expansive, you know, um, concerns of health humanities. And finally, the changing role of arts and humanities within health humanities. So let me start with the word inclusive. As you saw in the first part, medical humanities was just focused on physician or it was a physician centric approach. But then health humanities mm. is more inclusive in the sense that it included several stakeholders like doctors, caregivers, paramedics, patients, family, and so on. So I just want you to keep in mind the key word inclusive, which means more stakeholders are involved and then the physician is not in the center stage anymore. The second one is the broad and expansive concerns of medical humanities compared to, um, um, I mean, uh, health humanities compared to medical humanities. I just want you to draw my attention to the last part of this, um, you know, the broad concerns, the last point there, realization that health is a larger and more useful concept than disease. So in medical humanities phase, there was a lot more attention to the term disease, but then in health humanities phase, we look not just at disease alone, but then theorize and conceptualize the word health itself. And finally, look at the role of arts and humanities under health humanities. What you see here is a more engaged you know, involvement of arts and humanities, especially arts and humanities was seen as enabling health and well-being, as a reason for our well-being and health, which I would expand this concept of well-being and health in a couple of slides from now. And finally, the major objective of health humanities is also that it was a voice of critique. This is an um, expression, a uh, quote that I'm drawing from Craig Klugman and Erin Gentry Lamb. I quote, the spirit of health humanities is not just about understanding human experiences of health and healthcare. You can see that we have already moved from disease to health and healthcare. It's also about wielding a persistent voice of critique and working explicitly towards social justice. This beautifully sums up the very spirit of health humanities. But then I'm going to unpack the word 
Kriti for you. What does that mean? You know, Kriti and what is Kriti? In other words, how do we understand the word Kriti here? And what is the object of Kriti? Kriti here would mean that health humanities is interested in exposing the constellations of power. Critique here is where health humanities is interested in exposing the Foucauldian nexus of power and knowledge. And that works very well with a clinician or a clinical setup that works in laboratory. This also works very well um, in the figure of doctor. So critique should be understood in two um, subtle ways. One, as exposing the power, the constellations of power or sites of power. And two, the way how knowledge and power work together. And then, what is the object of critique? You know, what is being critiqued in health humanities? There are several ways to answer that, but then I'm going to give you two or three major objects of critique. One is the commercialization of health. The second is the relentless use of technology. Third is the way how a patient is objectified and treated within a clinical setup. Four, and this is very interesting also, is the way how every normal condition is pathologized, what we call as disease mongering. You know, this is what every common normal or slight abnormalities are sort of pathologized you know, made a medical or clinical problem. So there are multiple, as I said, objectives of critique, but then I have just laid out major uh, four of them. Finally, before I move to the next wave and then explain you other concerns of medical humanities and health humanities, I'm just giving you the summary of how medical humanities is different from health humanities. I'm just reading out, uh, in interest of time, I've got another 20, 25 minutes. So medical humanities, as I said, focused on doctors. Uh, the primary aim, as I said, is to create and cultivate those human qualities in doctors. And you see that medical humanities was mainly practiced in medical schools, and it was focused on skill development in doctors. And arts was very instrumental. As I said, it played a second fiddle to um, uh, medical curriculum. But in health humanities, as I said, slightly expansive, more inclusive, and broader. For instance, it focuses on all healthcare workers, which is to say patient, uh, doctors, paramedics, you know, um, uh, caregivers, both formal, informal, uh, patient, everyone is like covered under health humanities. It was more inclusive. It focused on issues like social justice as applied theory, as well as as a lived experience. And you also found health humanities uh, department in public health, nursing programs, and more interestingly, in humanities departments as well. And finally, the idea of the change in the status of arts and humanities, where arts was treated as um, having an inherent value and having some meaning in itself, arts as a way to heal oneself, but arts itself as illuminating certain disease condition. But then if you want more such kind of distinctions or differentiation, I invite you to read this wonderful, uh, timely article, which is published in 2017. You can see the reference there. The almost right word, the move from medical to health humanities by Teresa Johns. Now, this set of slides, uh, in case you are planning to do research in uh, health humanities, I'm going to list out what are the possible major areas of inquiry in health humanities? I'm going to list out five, six of them, and then I also talk about um, you know, the subsections uh, of each of them. So these are some of the major themes or fields of inquiry in uh, health humanities. The first one is narrative medicine. This is a term introduced by a Columbia professor who is also a professor of literature and also a practicing physician, the most influential figure in uh, health humanities 
her name is rita sharan rita sharan r i t a c h a r o n so this is one of the major thematic strand in health humanities narrative medicine and what do you do there you're basically using literature and arts and you're using them to improve the skills of the doctor so that's what is called as narrative medicine all right the second one uh, again one of the major uh, themes in health humanities is what is called the therapeutic uses of reading and writing technically it's called bibliotherapy and scriptotherapy so the scriptotherapy or bibliograph you know bibliotherapy is nothing but writing as a way to heal reading as a way to heal so it's it's like engaging the practice of literature doing literature producing literature to that of not cure but the idea of healing for instance i'm sure if you're familiar with trauma literature or sexual abuse literature you know we may come across these two important word bibliography bibliotherapy and scriptotherapy and there is this interesting book if you are you know uh, working on any of this area i invite you to look at and read this particular book or shattered subject shattered subject by henke i quote her here she says the process of writing out and writing through a traumatic experience is a mode of therapeutic reenactment so uh, according to henke if you write the the fact that you are writing the process of writing helps you to heal it does two things a writing enables paves way to healing through reenacting the traumatic event and she uses a very interesting expression called writing out and writing through so through the process of writing you are coming to terms with your own trauma or abusive you know situation so that's a very interesting you know strand the third important theme is writing about diseases the fourth one which is not much explored in um, across the world is the pedagogical uses of literature courses and medical curriculum that's more um, you know um, related to pedagogical interventions and so on so that's not uh, such a major field of thought but then rest of them are so i want you to look at uh, many of these trends the next one is the representation of the medical encounter in literary texts the medical case history as a literary genre and finally the changing literary depictions of disease but then if you are a student of literature or student of culture studies the last you know um, but one i mean the the last two themes i mean the representation of the medical encounter in literary uh, texts and changing literary depictions of diseases do matter a lot because the first one is to see how diseases are configured and represented in literary text but then let me also make a qualification here it's not just literary text as in the verbal narratives it's not confined to novel poetry and so on it may mean films it may mean comics it may mean any visual um, uh, material it may mean television it may mean even sculptures it may be even performative arts so that's the way how you need to look at the term literary text not necessarily as a written word and then the another interesting problem that a student of literature can pursue is the changing literary depictions of disease this is something that i have been doing in recent times for example i have been looking at how infertility um, is represented in 1960s and how these representations have changed over a period of time and one of my interesting finding is in 1960s and 1970s most of the infertility issues were related to women 
all right but then with globalization privatization and liberalization and more westernization happening in 1990s especially in india there is an interesting way how the question of infertility is negotiated in literary or cultural texts what you see these days is you know infertility is no more tied to women but then the issue is also discussed in relation to men but then you don't see that um, happening in earlier representation so this is a very interesting you know um, uh, discourse to see how a uh, same medical condition is represented in cultural text over a period of time in this case i started my research maybe three four months ago and i started uh, uh, my timeline is from 1970 to 2021 as I said, the first 70s, 80s, till 90s, so much of the question on infertility was tied to women. But then post 1990s, as I said, because of globalization and more privatization coming and so on, several reasons we can both social, cultural and economic, you can see there is a shift in the way infertility is represented. It becomes also male centric. So that's what I mean by changing literary depictions of these things. I'm also going to introduce you to some of the sub themes in uh, health humanities. I'm going to run some of them here, uh, which is one of the most popular uh, uh, engagement is about the representation and application of health illness in various media. As I said, uh, your uh, area might be not necessarily about the verbal narratives, but then it can also include painting, film, sculpture, digital storytelling, you know, how YouTube and those kinds of platforms are used to perform, to discuss the health conditions. Dance, Photography is again an, another um, interesting and emerging area where you can look at these questions on health and illness. Teaching health humanities, what we call as medical pedagogy, which is basically um, looking at uh, um, um, syllabi of you know, medical school and then seeing how uh, whether they have adequate representation of liberal arts in their field. Ethics, biomedical, medical ethics colonial environments and health you can also think of pandemics and epidemics my recent work is on pandemics and epidemics and how uh, culture and literary you know materials have worked on this particular issue narrative medicine which i have informed you then the other sub themes that you can seriously think are caring and nursing cam uh, which includes siddha you know, Ayurveda and alternative medicine. And I think you can figure out there is always a tension between alternative complementary medicine and then the Western allopathy medicine and the politics behind it, knowledge production, sites of knowledge production, you know, all those kinds of issues come under complementary and alternative medicine, digital health humanities, indigenous health based methods, health and politics. I think that's something that uh, most of uh, literature students might be aware of, thanks to Michel Foucault, starting with bio-governmentality, bio-power, bio-security, health and intersectionality, how you know, um, uh, queer, race, gender, sexuality, and religion intersect with uh, health. You know, th those are the questions of disability, ableism, and so on. So these are some of the major uh, sub-themes of, you know, health humanities now the next set i'm trying to ask this uh, uh, question uh, what does it mean when we say we are practicing health humanities because there are a lot of confusion among young scholars and even among senior faculty members when i say i'm working on health humanities the first question they might ask me is uh, am i a physician do i have an exposure to uh, medical science, uh, then my question is, or I'm trying to answer that very important question. How do we answer this? What is our position uh, here? <clears throat> so the first thing that you have to keep in mind here is, it's not necessary that you should have a medical degree to pursue health humanities. I think the word itself makes that clear. It's health humanities. It's not health sciences. And then I want to ask this question, what are we doing here when we say that you are or one is 
practicing health humanities? To answer this question, I'm giving you some samples so that you would really understand what we are doing here. The first one, I'm giving you an example here, breast cancer. Let's take this example, breast cancer. Okay, so if one were to give a clinical definition of breast cancer, it's as simple as this, as direct as this. Breast cancer is a type of cancer that starts in the breast. That's it. But then where is the medical humanities problem in, um, you know, breast cancer? Let's see this. Look at this. So breast cancer, clinically speaking, is just a type of cancer. But then you have cultural, social and literary issues related to breast cancer. For example, the beauty myth, you know, then issues related to sexuality, the idea of sexiness and how we place that idea, locate that idea in female breasts. And then there is this interesting cultural question of body image itself. So what you can see is as a student of literature, you are not interested in the clinical angle of breast cancer, which I have clearly defined as a type of cancer that starts in breast. But then as a cultural scientist or as a student of literature, your issues or your research are squarely within cultural, social and literary, which intersects with the clinical. And what are those issues? In this case, as I said, it's about the beauty myth. It's about the idea of sexiness itself. It's about how we always associate, you know, a female beauty with a full blown breast. So this is how we are, or this is the space that we create. And this is how we intervene into these issues. And I can give you another example, infertility. All right, let's take another example here. Simple terms, infertility is an inability to reproduce after repeated unprotected intercourse. And inf infertility is a gender neutral problem. In fact, if you were to look at it, infertility is so harmless, right? You know, just think about headache or anything which would draw its attention. But then infertility doesn't draw anyone's attention. It's less than, you know, in some sense, doesn't have much consequence on your body. It's such a harmless condition. But then you have to understand that's not exactly uh, the way how the world or the society perceives it. For example, how does an individual experience infertility in terms of gender, questions of shame, questions of stigma? This is what I'm telling you. So when you choose a problem, it has two aspects to it. There is one, the clinical aspect to it, which is not the botheration of a literary scholar or a cultural scientist. But then there is also the cultural, literary and narrative aspects to it, which is your concern or which is the prime focus for you. For example, in this case, infertility and gender, you know, uh, how do we always relate infertility with women and not necessarily men? Then there is a question of gender coming into the conversation, because technically speaking, Clinically speaking, infertility is a gender neutral problem, but then that's not the way how we um, configure infertility here in practice. Also, the idea of shame, you know, which is a very key term, infertility and shame, how is shame produced, how is it sustained, how, what shapes does um, the idea of shame, the effect that it creates takes in, the, you know, in literary texts and so on. So, there are several other options. So finally, this is my answer to your question. What does it mean when we say we are doing health humanities? The answer is A, we are taking a cultural approach, a narrative approach to um, uh, disease or illness condition or even health. We are focusing on the experiences of an individual who suffers that disease condition. We are focusing on the effective, which is, you know, I'm using effective in a very loose sense, not in a technical sense of effective as an effective theory, things like shame, you know, 
um, stigma, um, all those emotional aspects of disease. We are looking at the philosophical aspects of disease. What does it mean to talk of uh, disease in philosophical terms? For example, questions on ontology, you know, um, the questions of being, how does being experience time? How does being experience space? So those are all philosophical aspects. So what does it mean when we say we are doing health humanities? We are focusing on cultural, narrative, experiential, affective and philosophical aspects. If you have any questions, please make note. I will take them um, during Q&A. And then finally, this is the way I want to close this set of slide and then move to other important books that might be useful. Sick body as a registry and the locus of power relations, cultural constructs, events, drives and narratives. So we need not always think of sick, sick body as confined to clinical and medical, but then sick body has multiple registers. It's a layered body. You know, there is a lot of power relations. There is also a cultural construct that a sick body has to negotiate. The events and drives, which goes back to the idea that I spoke about, the affective principles and the kind of literature that is produced out of those experiences, which constitutes the narratives of the sick body. Now, I'm going to, I have roughly nine, 10 minutes, so I'm rushing here. I'm going to introduce you to some of the operative or key terms in health humanities. So these are the key terms, but then I want you to uh, uh, pay more attention to the key words illness and disease, which are so important for the entire you know, health humanities discourse. So let me read out the key words, health, illness, disease, sickness, wellness, and fitness. But then I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to introduce you to all these key terms. I'm just introducing you to the first two, I mean, the second and the third word, illness and disease. Now, I'm taking an example of headache um, and then make you understand how is the word disease different from illness. So let me start with the word disease. A disease uh, actually means a pain in the head with the pain being above the eyes or the ears, behind the head, or in the back of the upper neck, which is a clinical and uh, representation and definition of a headache as a disease condition. But then, our concentration as a cultural scientist is not about the clinical definition, but the way we experience the idea of the disease condition called headache. For example, some of you might experience headache as feels like a pair of pliers on the optic nerve or like a football helmet seven size, as though the devil pulls his pitchfork out only to heat it up to put it back. I feel a severe burning sensation while at the same time a freezing sensation. Feels like a very severe electric shock. So what you see here is the difference between disease and illness. In other words, disease is biological dysfunction. It means the failure of a physiological system. But then, as I said, that's for a clinician or a physician to take care of. That's not my interest. My interest is with illness. I'm interested in how you experience that particular disease condition and how you express that disease condition, which takes the form of a narrative, which I would explain in coming slides. So I want you to understand there is a difference between the word disease and illness. Disease is biological, and that's the job of a physician to cure, solve, whatever you want to call it. But then as a cultural scientist or as a student of literature, you should be interested in how that disease is experienced by you, which is to say that you pay attention to the felt experience, the emotional weight, the psychic state, and how you interpret it, how you interpret and perceive that, the idea of the meaning that you attribute 
to that particular disease condition. So one thing that you have to keep in mind, the fundamental difference between disease and illness, and your job is to pay attention to illness, which is to say that you would pay more attention to the subjective experience of disease. You will pay attention to the symbolic meanings of disease. You would pay attention to the felt experience of a disease. Now let me slowly introduce you to some of the uh, narratives, which is called on illness narratives. Who are the narratives, narrators, and what structure does these illness take place? So I've got roughly five minutes, so I'm rushing here. So you can uh, think of the plethora of illness narrative broadly into two. There is this physical illness, and there is something called the mental illness. And under physical illness, you can further divide into chronic physical illness conditions like HIV, AIDS, diabetes, cancer, TB. And then there is disability conditions, deafness, dumbness, blindness, amputation. And then a lot of um, um, mental illness narratives like Alzheimer, which is a neurodegenerative schizophrenia, OCD, bipolar disorder, and so on. So uh, if you are planning to take uh, health humanities as your uh, research, this is the first thing that you have to You have to sort of decide whether you would pursue uh, narratives on mental illness or physical illness. In case you choose physical illness, again, you have to um, decide whether you're focusing on disability narratives or chronic illness. I'm going to introduce you a very useful term which would sum up the whole uh, illness narratives. I just want you to make note of this word, pathography. All right. So what is pathography? And let's talk a bit about their etymology. As you know, uh, pathie, uh, which means illness or suffering, it has Greek roots. And then a pathography, as Hawkins um, uh, brilliantly sums up, I quote, an autobiographical or biographical narrative about an experience of illness, disability, or illness behaviors. So basically, a pathography is a narrative. It's a narrative uh, based on one's experience of illness. Now, who prepares or who are the key players, actors, and narrators here? There are multiple possibilities that you can think of. One, illness has multiple narrators. The first one is the suffering person or, you know, I most of the time, because I practice health humanities, I refuse to use the word patient, but then I just want you to, uh, instead I'm using the word, the suffering person. You know? There's a huge politics behind it, why we are making that semantic shift. But then in just of time, I'm not going to those details. But then um, the suffering person or the patient narrates his own experience. So one possibility is the person, the suffering person. The second, a family member, may be narrating um, uh, the entire illness episode. Third, professional caregiver, a nurse, might be narrating the entire uh, disease event. And three possibility is the third possibility is physicians. There are so many physicians, new age physicians, who also write you know, about uh, disease conditions. And there are three possibilities here. One, they share about their cultural and the clinical history of the disease. Two, they are a witness to the suffering person and they narrate how uh, they dealt with a particular person. It may be a case study or it may be their life experience. And three, the doctors themselves becoming, becoming a suffering person. That is like doctor come patient. You know, they are talking about their own disease condition. I'm going to give you several examples in uh, you know, a couple of slides from now. Two more minutes to go. But then uh, these are the multiple narrators. I repeat. One is the suffering person or the patient. The second uh, is the family members or caregivers. And then you have professional caregivers like nurses. And finally, the physicians. Let me give you some examples of the text. The first one, I think uh, most of you are familiar uh, with this bestseller, The Test of My Life from Cricket to Cancer and Back by Yuvraj Singh. You know that um, uh, he, it's an autobiography of Yuvraj Singh. And 
uh, I mean, he's in no introduction, but then uh, Indian cricketer, and he narrates about um, his cancer experience. And then uh, towards the end, you see him as a cancer survivor. The second one is mom's cancer. Mom's Cancer is an autobiographical web comic by Breen Fees, which describes his mother's fight against lung cancer. But there is a difference between book one and book two. Yurat Singh's um, The Test of My Life is an autobiographical work, which is basically to say the person, the suffering person is sharing the experience. Book two is different because Brain Feast is not the suffering person. He is a witness to his mother's suffering. So this would be an example for a caregiver's interpretation of um, uh, a narration or a disease condition. The third one, Taking Turns, is another interesting uh, book. It again takes a comics format. But then what is, how is it different from the two other texts? Because this is written by a practicing nurse, all right? And then she shares about her experience and life conditions in uh, uh, clinical units, which is a HIV AIDS care unit 371. Uh, I'm going to close with this. I have several other slides. Maybe I'll take some of those questions later. But then uh, this is a classic book Then I want all of you to read when breath becomes air, Paul Kalaniti. And remember, Paul Kalaniti is a physician, but then he suffers from, uh, he's a very uh, famous American neurosurgeon. It is basically a memoir, but the interesting thing about this book is Paul Kalaniti is a neurosurgeon, but then he also battles, you know, stage four lung cancer. So here is a figure of patient come physician. Similarly, Oliver Sacks, A Leg to Stand On. This is a personal experience of a doctor who suffers from a major injury to his leg. So these are two examples of how doctors who turn to um, patients and then they share their experience. And finally, the winner of the Pulitzer Prize book, The Emperor of All Malady. This is written by a doctor, Siddhartha Mukherjee. But then you have to also understand this is a history of the evolution of cancer. And you can rightly see it's called a biography of cancer. So these are some of the examples. But then these are some of the major texts in health humanities. I can give you a range of other imaginative works as well. Uh, Professor, can I take three more minutes? Uh, sure, sir. Yes, sir. Just take three more minutes and then. Uh, this is the structure of any illness narratives. Uh, any illness narratives, if you were to look at it, uh, can be broadly, this is the structure that it takes. Usually, the text begins with a discovery of being ill, and there will be a lot of discussion of the diagnosis, the hardships of treatment, and finally, a comic closure. But then I want you to understand what exactly is a comic closure. Comic closure is where the protagonist or uh, the narrator feels much better than how, um, uh, the, uh, how he started with. So usually a structure of illness narrative has four parts to it. As I said, being ill, the diagnosis part, and the sharing of um, the treatment, and finally, the betterment of the individual. So it takes that formulaic and has a lot of that documentary you know, character to it. And finally, I'm going to introduce to the narrative types. I want you to read this particular book if you are interested in health humanities. It's called The Wounded Storyteller by Arthur Frank, where he discusses three major types of health humanities narrative. The first one is restitution narrative, chaos narrative, and quest narrative. Because we completed narrators, we spoke about the shape a narrative takes, I thought we will close with the narrative types. The first one is restitution narrative. Please make note. A restitution narrative is very simple plot. Uh, let me paraphrase it for you so that it's very easy to understand. It's something like, yesterday I was healthy. Today I am sick. Tomorrow I will be healthy again. So if a particular narrative takes this particular shape, yesterday I was healthy. I'm sick today. I'll be much better off tomorrow. 
he calls it as restitution narrative. This is where life returns to normal. But then in Kaios narrative, it's slightly complicated. As you see the word Kaios, it's life is never going to become better. Therefore, the stories, the way you narrate your stories are going to be chaotic and they are also called as anti-narratives. And finally, the third one is quest narrative, where the whole illness narrative is a process of transformation. Look, I just want you to concentrate on the word quest, where illness becomes a context, an occasion for a journey that becomes a quest. So if you are interested in these, you know, several other categorization, you can read the wounded storyteller. I'm running out of time. It's already 4.35. I'll just show the slides and then I'm not going to explain it for you. In case you're interested, these are some of the texts. Um, Health Humanities Reader, Health Humanities, Rutledge Handbook of Medical Humanities, Narrative Medicine, Teaching Health Humanities. I want all of you to concentrate on this wonderful uh, book, The Edinburgh Companion to Critical Medical Humanities. It sort of inaugurates the third phase of uh, medical humanities. These are some of the recent books, The Rutledge Companion to uh, Health Humanities, Research Methods in Health Humanities, Medical Humanities and Medical Education. These are some of the major journals in the field. I'm not going to read out all of them, but then I would consider uh, BMJ, the last two, AMA, they are some of the best journals and so is literature and medicine. In case you are planning to pursue your medical humanities course abroad, these are some of the major research center. One of the finest institutions which does uh, medical humanities in a very serious way is Durham University, Center for Medical Humanities, King's College London and so on. And third wave, as I said, this is the most important book which sort of inaugurates the third wave. These are some of the key concepts. And what I see here is the convergence of health humanities with uh, eco-criticism, which is called as environmental humanities or planetary health. And some of the future possibilities are digital health humanities. These are less explored and less examined spaces. So in case you are interested, you can take some of these issues for your research project, um, uh, for your postdoc degree, whatever. Digital health humanities, comparative health humanities, post-humanism, health humanities in India, graphic medicine, and so on. Uh, this is my area of interest, graphic medicine, which is uh, using comics to express uh, one's experience of illness. This is one of the sample pages. It's very complex and challenging. And if you are interested in some of the books uh, that, you know, that I author or co-author, the recent one is Pandemics and Epidemics in Cultural Representation, published by Spring the Nature 2022. But then I have written uh, books on infertility, eating disorders, and um, mental illness. Uh, you can download all my research articles, like more, more than 100 articles through academia. It's like free. You can read and you can share your views about it. So thank you so much uh, for your patient listening. I'm ready to take uh, questions if you have or any comments or anything that you can take to. Thank you very much, uh, dear sir, for uh, that uh, an engaging uh, session. And you literally uh, justify the title that we gave uh, to this webinar, Roadless Travel. And I'm sure that there will be many uh, uh, travelers with you in this. Uh, <laughs> I, hope so. <laughs> I hope yes, so. Sure, sir. <laughs> sir. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, see, Dan, and really, you know, that I enjoyed and uh, I'm well bound, you know, that uh, I listen everything new. Yeah. And uh, yeah, what you have done, you know, is something remarkable. and. Uh, my children, you know, here in Gandhigram and uh, almost uh, absolutely from entire India, you know, that they, they listen and uh, they also benefited, you know, a lot. Thank you. So, though delight, you know, I'm sorry, extremely, I made you, you know, change, you know, twice, you know, the dates. <laughs> no, and, no, uh, perfectly all right, you know, we have come a long way yeah. <laughs> from that particular. Uh, thank if you. If we have thank any questions, I will take them and yeah. then say. Uh, yeah, no, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. There is one question from uh, Ms. Anju Maria. Um, she says, uh, I'm doing research in fat studies with the mm. emphasis on Foucault and biopower. Can you help me with primary text and theory works on the team in Indian context? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, who is this? Can I have a uh, yeah. 
Yeah, you can also see that in the messages, sir. It is uh, oh. one Anju Maria. Ah, uh, no, I don't see here. It's the first. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, Anju first. Maria. Yeah, that's um, a very interesting question. Thank you for the wonderful and very helpful session. I'm doing this in fact today with emphasis on Foucault. Uh, okay. Um, see, one thing that you have to keep in mind is health humanities. Uh, Anju Maria, I hope you are listening to me. Uh, is a uh, emerging field in India. All right. So we don't have even primary sources for cancer and so on. We have very restricted list of health humanities. So, um, but then fact studies is an emerging area in the West. I'm sure you would find so many books, readers, and articles out there, but not in the Indian context that I know of. Uh, if you can share your email ID, I can send you two or three books on fact studies. That's the best that I can do. But then to answer your question, do we have a primary source uh, in Indian context? I don't know, but then I'm afraid not many people have, you know, many authors write about their experience of this in Indian context. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. I, actually, there is a, a question from uh, the resource person in the previous session, uh, okay. Dr. Blaze Johnny, and he is asking for an app usage or a, a term to denote health studies in Tamil. Oh, I don't know that health studies in Tamil because you know I can give an excuse all the time that I'm not from Tamil Nadu, I'm from Kerala. Oh, yeah, he's from Kerala as well. <laughs> but I, I, think... I don't know, maybe you know, uh, Professor Baskaran might give us an equivalent term for health humanities. Or no, I already told you, you know, that I'm spellbound, you know, that I listen everything new. He wants a Tamil word for <laughs> uh, health it humanities, yeah. I, I don't know what might be the word Maybe for I'll health. Tell you. I'll do you know, I'll take a few minutes and then uh, I'll inform him. Yeah. yeah. Is my but I know Ilakiam may not be the right word. I'm just looking for a word called, you know, a tra Tamil translation for the word health. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe uh, someone has to help. Yeah, it's, I think it's a challenge for all uh, teachers of translation studies here. <laughs> yes. yes. Sir, we have another question from uh, Mridul Mrinal. Um, yeah. He says, uh, Sir, how far the technological advancements are catering to the progress of the third wave of health humanities? Mm. Is it at a crossroad of, of digital humanities and health humanities? Yeah. Uh, uh, Mridul, Mridul, are you there? Or you left? Uh, uh, yes, sir, I'm here. Mridul, that's a very interesting question, but then I want you to understand uh, two things here. One, is how technology is represented in these narratives. Is that clear, Mridul? Hello, Mridul? Yeah, I think uh, Mridul is available. Yes, sir. Uh, OK. Mridul, am I audible and clear to you? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, see, I just want you to know that there are two aspects to your question, and I don't want you to confuse both of them. The first one is what is called the digital humanities and how digital humanities converges with health humanities, where you would be looking at YouTube. You get the point there? All right? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's the convergence of digital humanities and uh, health humanities. But then when you talk of technological advancements, you mean you have to look at how the use of technology and instruments are used in literary texts. These are two different issues. All right. And both can be researched. But then you have to decide what is the course of your action. Would you like to see how technology and such instruments and equipments are represented in literary text or cultural text, or whether you would be looking at um, uh, digital humanities intersecting with uh, you know health humanities, which is to see how YouTube and other such spaces are contributing to the discourse of health humanities. So there are two strands, and you have to decide which way to go. Now that